May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. The words of my mouth. We'll come back to that verse later on. Um, you may not know this, but it helps me. Um, as uh, as uh, Mary was saying about the helps in the Bible, when there's a title, I like to give my sermons a title. This one has the title of Tongue Wagging. Tongue Wagging. We've had uh, James chapter 3 read to us and it's in two parts. Part 1 and part 2, conveniently. And, uh, and Taming the Tongue is part 1. Um, I try not to repeat the error of uh, James chapter 1 and that's to, to dissect every single verse. I um, just want to concentrate on this idea of taming the tongue. As a minister in the church, I get a, the real joy and the kick and the privilege of being able to attend so many church meetings in a year. It's unbelievable. Sometimes I may even have two or three meetings on the same day or on the same evening. And I am so very conscious of the need for us to heed James' advice concerning the tongue. Now I know some of you will find this very hard to believe, but it is true, that just occasionally in church meetings there can be snide comments, there can be backbiting. When God wanted something doing, he didn't form a committee. Someone else said, after all said and done, there's a lot more said than done. You know, we spend so much time talking, not enough time doing. It's true in the church, and it's true in the world. I am not a great believer in having meetings for the sake of having meetings. Time and energy can be used to greater effect elsewhere. The definition of a committee, where minutes are taken and hours are lost, it does concern me that in the church we can be so very guilty of wagging our tongues and to no useful end. In the church we can be so good at generating hot air that often leaves a chill wind. And sometimes if we're not careful, our church groups and meetings and even prayer meetings can become gossip shops. There's a very fine line between sharing genuine concerns about people and their well-being and spreading gossip. And it's a, it's a line that we must be careful not to cross. And I believe this is one of God's concerns. And there is so much teaching in the Bible. And um, I'm just sticking in the book of Proverbs to give some examples. Proverbs 10, 19. When words are many, sin is not absent, but those who hold their tongue are wise. Proverbs 11, verses 12 to 13. A person who lacks judgment derides their neighbor, but a person of understanding holds their tongue. A gossip betrays a confidence, but trustworthy people keep secrets. Proverbs 12, verse 18. Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. And Proverbs 15, verse 4. The, the, the tongue that brings healing is a tree of life, but a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. Yes, we're getting the picture. The tongue has an enormous um, influence because of the direction it sets. James gives us two examples of, of, um, of how the tongue can direct the course of events. He gives the example of putting the bit in a horse's mouth to make them obey us. He says we can turn the whole animal. Now, uh, may not surprise you, to hear that I'm not a horsey person. Um, 
But I remember when our children were small, on one of our holidays, we passed the sign which said pony trekking. And Dad thought, yeah, good idea. Let's go pony trekking. Um, not only am I not a horsey person, I'm a townie. And uh, the last time I'd been on a pony, it wasn't a pony at all, it was a donkey on the beach. And I just had this idea. I was going to cock my leg on and off we went. Mm, I needed a pair of step ladders to climb on board. Not only was this pony yowge, it was, well, it had a mind of its own. And it knew that it had an amateur on its back. The reason, you see, was that the bit was in the wrong hands. When we got back to base, one of the children from the uh, place where they keep horses, the stables, that's it, climbed on board and the pony was a different animal. What for me was a wild horse to this young child was a tame pony. And our tongues, if we're not careful, can be like wild horses when they ought to be tame ponies. Or take ships as an example, James says in verse 4. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. My wife, Emma, and myself are at a certain age now where we have an empty nest and uh, we can experiment. And when we had our silver wedding, we, we sailed away on a cruise, not knowing whether we'd like it or not, and we love it. And we keep sailing away and coming back. And um, last year, we, 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 we sailed on the p and cruise ship Britannia the largest in the p and fleet, weighing in at approximately 144,000 tonnes, over 1,000 feet in length, almost 240 feet high, carrying 4,324 passengers and 1,398 officers and crew, the biggest in the fleet. And yet, despite its immense size, this huge ship is steered by one person with a control which is like a children's console. Um, the little, what do you call it? Joystick. <laughs> Got all the technical stuff coming out this morning. I, I don't do games. Mm. And its steers are very small. What you might appear, or what might appear to be insignificant rudder it steers the whole ship and James is saying the tongue in comparison is like that small insignificant part but it has the potential to do tremendous damage and controlling the tongue James says is one of life's greatest challenges a wise person once said that the reason a dog has so many friends is that it wags its tail more than it wags its tongue. In verses 5 and 6, James says, The tongue is a very small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. It's a fire of a world of evil among the parts of the body because it corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of life on fire, and itself is set on fire by hell. Consider how a great forest is set on fire by a small spark and as Mary reminded us of the fires on the moors in Greater Manchester where a major incident is underway. A small spark can set a huge fire and do a lot of damage. You see fire burns as long as it has fuel and idle gossip is the fuel of destructiveness when it comes to the tongue. So as followers of Jesus, there is work to be done because we have to see that in the way that we live our lives, we are not fueling those fires, the fires of gossip and slander and malice. And let's be honest, we're tempted. 
when people are pulling others apart and throwing muck on the heap. Sometimes we might want to say, oh, and you forgot about this. <laughs> they're also like this. Oh and, they all, oh, and I saw them do that one day. We want to say, oh, yes, they're, they're horrible people. They're nasty people. I have experience of that. And we join in before we know it. And what we have to be very careful of is that we are not harming the body, self-harming. Because when we pull one another apart, that's what we do in the life of the church. James says, another warning, verses 7 and 8. All kinds of animals, birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed. But no one can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. The story of a woman in an Indian village who maliciously gossiped about another lady and her family in the village. And one day she discovered that what she'd been saying was wrong. She'd got this lady all wrong. So she had a change of heart and she went to see the village wise man and she asked how she could take back all the wrong that she'd done. And the wise man told her to go home and kill all her chickens. And then, having killed all her chickens, she was to pluck all her chickens and to put the feathers in a bag. And then she was to come back to the wise man with the feathers in a bag. So she went home, she killed all her chickens, she plucked all her chickens, she put the feathers in a bag, and she went back to the wise man. Now, the wise man said, on the windiest of days, you go to the highest of places and I want you to scatter those feathers into the winds. And so on the windiest of days, she went to the highest of places and she scattered her feathers and off they went into the winds. And then he said, and then come back to me with the empty bag. So she came to the wise man with the empty bag and she said, I've been to the highest of places on the windiest of days and I've scattered the feathers. What next? And then the wise man said, now go, Alice, and go and pick up every last feather and then come back to me. And she said, but that, that, I can't, I can't. They've gone, they've spread. There's no retrieving what's gone and been scattered. It's impossible. And the wise man said, and so it is with your careless words. They are like scattered into the wind it is impossible to retrieve just coincidentally I was in Reedy Cottage School on Sunday and Jenny asked if I would uh, speak she'd been speaking about kind words and they asked one of the children to come and I had a few routine tasks and uh, this was one of them I squeezed the toothpaste on top seen this toothpaste before so I knew that they expected to see what it looked like and it smelled like ice cream. I had to put the toothpaste back into the tube then and squeeze it again. I realised that this could be the message I was sharing with the children was that once the words are out you can't take them back. Once the tongue has done its worst Except pray and love, but we can move on. Our Lord, James, reminds us in verses 9 and 10, with our tongues we praise the Lord, and with it we curse people, those same people who are made in God's likeness, in his image. Out of the same mouth comes praise and comes cursing, and this should not be. This should not be. Simple as. Christians, we need to control our tongues, to watch our words, to be known as people of God because we speak God's language. We speak God's language. And God's language 
It's a language of God. It speaks in tongues. Only we know it's God's people because we speak this language. In the second part, we come to um, the second part of chapter 3. The heading, two kinds of wisdom. James reminds us that there are, there, are, there are two kinds of wisdom. There is earthly wisdom and there is spiritual wisdom, heavenly wisdom. So I went looking for some earthly wisdom. And I shared some quotes from a webpage I found entitled Kids' Little Instructions on Language. And this may well be the most instructive part of this sermon this morning. Some good advice here. Patrick, age 10, says... Never trust a dog with what it's not good for. Stephanie, aged eight, has come up with a good idea. She says, sleep in your clothes and you'll be dressed in the morning. Rosemary, seven, never try to hide a piece of broccoli in a glass of milk. Kelly, ten, ten-year-old Kelly, don't ever be too full for dessert. Heather, 16, when your dad is mad and he says, do I look stupid, don't answer him. <laughs> Michael, age 14, never tell your mum a diet's not working. <laughs> Joel, 12, don't pick on your sister when she's got a baseball bat in her hand. <laughs> Laura, 13, don't try and baptise a cat. Hank, 12, never tell your little brother that you're not going to do what your mum told you to do. Chelsea, age 7, listen to your brain. It's got lots of information. <laughs> Philip, age 13, never, never dare your little brother to paint a flower bed. <laughs> and Randy, age 9, stay away from prunes. Worldly wisdom. It comes to us as a result of living in the world. And as much uh, as these kids' instructions on life are fun, worldly wisdom can also be unspiritual um, and manifesting itself in envious ways, in envy and selfish ambition, so warns James. As Christians, we should be contrasting worldly wisdom with heavenly wisdom, with spiritual wisdom. He says to those who read his words, read his words today, to seek the wisdom that comes from heaven, which is pure peace, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit. He says heavenly wisdom is impartial and sincere. It is to be sought. As Christians, we should be seeking it. How do we get this wisdom? Well, come back next week because uh, James chapter 4, I'm not sure who's delivering that, but it might be. He touches on this in chapter 4. Um, but uh, I just want to uh, go back to James chapter 1 and 2 to remind you of the following. sat at your feet yet um, and I haven't listened to what you had to say about James chapter 2 yet um, but if we want worldly wisdom we must familiarise ourselves with God's ways we must be in tune with God with his truth and with his righteousness that's chapter 1 um, we must put the word into practice we have to be doers all in chapter 1. Then in chapter 2, James reminds us that faith without deeds is a dead faith. <laughs> faith without deeds is dead. Faith is wonderful. Faith is a God-given gift. God gives to us the gift of faith. And some of us have it 
combine a bundle into some others. But it's not how much faith we have, it's what we do with the faith that we have, that we put it in the almighty God who created this world and all that is in it. Faith is a wonderful God-given gift. But the deeds which accompany our faith, what we do as a result of having faith is our gift to God. Here I am, putting my faith into practice. I am a doer of the word. We cannot have faith and then not produce good deeds. And finally, I believe when we have this heavenly wisdom, we will find that our tongues stop wagging when we've got it. Have you got it? Does your tongue wag? Is your tongue wagging less than it used to? Well, then maybe you were getting it and need more. So I began the sermon with a prayer often used by preachers at the beginning of their sermon, a prayer from the Psalms. It's a prayer I believe each one of us should pray before we open our mouths. Before Psalm 19, verse 14. And so I end as I began with this prayer from the Psalms. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Psalm 19, verse 4.